what is entrepreneurship as a word to you, Dr. Patra? Well, I actually began in 74. And between 74 and 82, I was, you know, working like any other doctor in a polyclinic. 82, I started my first entrepreneurship and branded clinic. For me, entrepreneurship is a lot about risk taking. It's a lot about belief in yourself. And uh, I think when you have belief in yourself and you combine it with risk taking, I think you automatically become an entrepreneur. So do you understand technology or have you deployed people who understand technology? What have you done? Or you have made a combination of both? I think I first sourced the right people. And that's very important. I mean, and you learned on the way? No, and I taught them what needs to be done. <laughs> Because they don't understand my business. So my CIO who heads is from Tata's, wonderful guy. And he's been with us for almost now seven, eight years. He's made all these, you know, systems for us. But how does it affect our business? What is it that needs to be done as a doctor? What needs to be done from a consumer perspective as far as a patient is concerned? Would he understand that as an IT person? He would not. So I would, so the application is mine and the technology is professional. So you have invested heavily in technology with deploys and make sure that the customers, these patients are comfortable, they're happy, the doctors are on track, the doctors are being monitored. You make sure that your system delivers all of those requirements that you're having as a business owner. That's including, what you've done. Including operation time. I can press a button and come to know how much time each doctor has spent with the patient. So Dr. Batra, every doctor is a self-employed professional, but you converted yourself from a self-employed professional to an entrepreneur. When did the actual entrepreneurial journey begin after 1982? When did you start multiplying? I started multiplying in 1996. Uh, and it was all by accident. You know, fate is... So 1992 to 1996, you were a self-employed professional. Yes, 82 to 96, I was a self-employed professional. For 14 years, I ran, I ran a very successful practice, which was like a general practice. I used to see about 300 patients in a day and uh, in a very small place. And uh, I then gave that up at some stage and I then went into specialty practice, which was also around 1996. And my practice fell from 300 patients a day to two patients a week. But I enjoyed it very much because I spent a lot of time with my patients and I you know, uh, knew everything about them and their families. Uh, so it was a wonderful period. But around that time, a lot of things happened by accident. You know, like I said, my son was you know, going to qualify as a doctor. I didn't have the money and I could never dream that I could buy property or real estate. Some of you must be, you know, real estate people over here. And, you know, I found that I couldn't, and you yourself, but, you know, even in, even in the 90s, I could not afford real estate in Mumbai, and I couldn't think that I can, you know, have money for my son to practice in Mumbai. So I went to Bangalore, and my brother was that time in real estate, so I got a good deal, and I set up a clinic for him with, you know, really a lot of love and care. I flew every weekend, I selected the marble, I selected everything, you know. And that came as a very fresh kind of a thing. People loved it. Uh, the Bangalore Clinic did extremely well. And then that started the thing for a multi-city practice. So I would practice 20 days in Bombay and 10 days in Bangalore. One point which we observed in this is that you practice for 14 years out of two clinics, one in Bangalore, one in Bombay. Yes. So in the around 41 years of practice, 45% of your time you're working as a self-employed person and around 55% of the time, you establish this empire which uh, stretches more than 200 clinics, has gone international, you are present all across the country, you are present in Dubai, you are present in UK, you are present in Abu Dhabi, you are present in multiple locations. Yes. So how did this quick transition happen? I, I read about you where it said that you used to open two clinics in a year, till recently you started opening, in consecutive 10 days you opened up 10 clinics. How did no, that confidence no. come and no, how did it happen? Such speed. No, no, that happened, but uh, I mean, that's not actually true. So I just want to correct that. Uh, the entire company and the corporate life as an entrepreneur has only started 15 years ago. Like I said, we started in 2000, 2001, by the time we really established the company. And when we started, we used to open two clinics a year, which is right. And later on, we then, you know, we tried to benchmark actually, you know, we believe a lot of things that we do we benchmark with, comp not necessarily competition, because when you're the forerunner and there's nothing to benchmark, then whom do you benchmark against? So you benchmark not against other doctors, but you benchmark against other leaders in industry. So for example, what do we do? We say that if my front desk in my clinic takes 10 minutes to register, they will really get a firing. Why? Because when I go to Jet Airways, my registration is done in one minute or three minutes. 
If I go to Taj, my registration is done in one minute. So why should it be 10 minutes? You know. So operational excellence doesn't necessarily happen through the industry. It happens by benchmarking the best that is happening all over. And that's what we followed. So when you follow that, we try to follow the Axis Bank. If you remember some time ago, the Axis Bank had a very aggressive plan. One branch a day. One branch a day. So I said, can we do it? Let's try. And of course, we had neither the capital nor the resources to do that. But that's the time when we came close. We said, let's give it a shot. And let's see whether we can open one clinic. And we then opened one clinic in 10 days. But then again, we didn't open for many other days after that. So That's fine. But so, that 10 days was a record. But that was a record. We could do that. And even today, <laughs> uh, we still have a record because we now open for the last maybe four or five months, one new clinic every week. So from two clinics a year, we are now up to anywhere between six to eight clinics a month. So I'm sure, Dr. So, Batra, you can write a book on delegation because all this can happen only by delegation of authority and responsibility. How do you balance that? That's again not very easy. Because I think in order to delegate, you first need to trust. And in order to build trust, you first need to bring the right people on board. So I think a lot of time actually goes into selecting your CEOs, your group CEOs, your HODs. And I think if they are right and then Sometimes it takes a year or two years to actually mentor them. Because, you know, I always say that everybody's a profession. I mean, which is wonderful. They're very, very good as chartered accountants, as marketing, as, you know, HODs. But do they understand your business? That is very important. And therefore, I think to hone in professional managers into thinking as entrepreneurs, as business people, is where the challenge comes. Because if the person is still an HOD, but is going to work as a salaried person who's sitting in a, you know, big office, and he's just throwing his weight around, I mean, it doesn't help the company at all. So I think to convert, you know, professional people into entrepreneurs in their own small way is what is the challenge. And I think once you do that, and it took me almost two years to, to do that, once I did that, I could then trust and then I could delegate. And today I virtually sit, I mean, maybe four or five days in a month on just meetings and with my HODs. And rest of the time, I'm you know, free to paint and sing and dance and do whatever I want to do and come here and talk to you. What I would like to understand from you, Dr. Batra, is our success depends on the number of talented people we acquire. Individually, that talented person should be more talented than the business owner. But he needs to be under the control of the business owner. How do you manage that? And how do you do talent acquisition? Yeah, first of all, I don't believe in control. Control is not a good word. I believe in decontrol. When you are running large operations, you know, we've got all very small operations, but in multiple locations. So when you're doing that, then you have to decentralize. If you don't decentralize and you don't decontrol, you cannot grow. So my philosophy is just the opposite of control, is how quickly can you decontrol, how quickly can you decentralize, because that is how then you can grow very fast. When each branch and each clinic and each branch head starts thinking of himself as a profit head, that's when the change happens. If he's still going to be part of the whole you know, somebody else is making money from somebody else. And just to, you know, address the point that you said about the foundation, you know, uh, I believe that I'm very passionate about it. And, you know, sometimes in some countries you have this 10% formula where out of every project you give me 10%. I have the 1% formula in my company. 1% of the profitability of the company goes to the foundation every year. 1% of employee salaries goes to the foundation every year. 1% of all the large projects that we do go to the foundation here. So the philosophy in the company, therefore... Even your vendors contribute 1%. Even the vendors. No, I mean, limited vendors contribute 1%. So the philosophy in the company, and this is what keeps me going, is that we create wealth to share wealth. And I think if you Fantastic. have that philosophy... Fantastic. So I think uh, you are a very different type of thinking personality. So I'll ask you a different question. Sure. What was your first mover disadvantage? Rather than first, asking you the first more advantage. Well, it's always a disadvantage. Because number one, it's, uh, there's no benchmark to follow, like I said earlier. Number two, uh, I mean, you can't copy anybody else. Everybody else can copy you. And so you've got so many, you know, stands up which come, stand alone which come after that, which have similar colors of blue and red. And unfortunately, intellectual property in India is still not very easy to, to manage. So you still have lots of breakaway groups who go and try to do the same thing. But I think we are able to deal with that in a major way. The one thing is that we are ahead in innovation at least by five years from anybody else. 
So by the time they catch up, we are five years ahead. So it really doesn't matter what they're doing. Because if you go to any other person who's broken away, he's doing what we did five years ago. And when you come to us, we're doing something new. So people know that, they appreciate that. So I think one way of making sure that you're always ahead of the curve, um, then it doesn't bother you. Uh, but otherwise, yes, I think it's a disadvantage because uh, it costs a lot of money to learn. You know, learning is very expensive. So your learning curves become financially and time-wise very long. Very long. And it comes by experimentation. You know, I, I went to Harvard. My son said, now you're 60 years old, you go to Harvard. I was one of the oldest students in Harvard. And I did a course in medical excellence. And one of the things I learned over there was that, you know, people in Harvard learn how to give failure parties, especially in the pharma industry. Because you fail early to succeed quickly. That's the philosophy. Get so how does your so. business model work for you, Dr. Batra? Is it your idea which is implemented by your team? Or is it your team's idea which you get it implemented? Which way does it work? It's both ways. And I think... Most of the times? 50-50, to that's be honest. That's a diplomatic answer. <laughs> no, that's, I think that's, that's the true answer because they would back it if they were here. But that's the true answer because I think uh, when you have professional managers, I think as an owner, the first thing to do is to learn from them. And I think if you lose the capacity to learn from your professional managers, you've lost a lot of goodness. So, like I said, they, have, they come with so much of wealth of knowledge, why would we not utilize it? The question is, how do we apply that knowledge to our business? That's what is important. And that's the only change that needs to be done. So, you know, they come with a lot of ideas. So, can we adopt some of those ideas? Can we absorb them? That's all that we have to do. And similarly, then we have some dreams and, you know, I mean, I, you know, still feel, you know, like it was Sir Robert Frost who said, you know, that the woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have many promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. Yeah. You know, super, super. so I feel that, you know, as you said, 86 countries where homeopathy is now recognized. We are today only in five countries. So I still have to capture another 81 countries. I have a long way to go. So in India, I may have, you know, done 130 <laughs> cities and I have covered every city which has got more than one lakh population. But I haven't covered so many countries yet. So even countries like Luthania and wherever, whatever you know you have on the map, why should I not get there? What, so have, you learned, way to go. what have you learned from globalization and how did you apply it to your business? Globalization is a big challenge. And it doesn't work the way you want it to work. I mean, that's my lesson. And you know, I failed many times in everything that I did abroad. Because the cultures are different, the laws are different. Uh, the regulation for health and food is the strictest out of any industry. So, for example, in Dubai, when we started, in for first three years, we lost a lot of money. Uh, we started in Dubai Healthcare City. We were the only Indian company there. We still are. Today, it's the largest turnover clinic of ours in the world, as a single clinic. You know, we get something like 300 patients a day on a weekend, you know, in Dubai, where homopathy was not well known when we started. So, it takes time. It's a huge challenge. Then also, you know, understanding people is a challenge. Uh, when I set up my second clinic, you know, the law said you have to have your operations in place, you have to have your HR in place. So I paid for doctors, staff, you know, operational setup, everything, invested money. I got my license after 22 months. So for two years, I paid the, and the average time for any such international clinic is about six months to get a license. So you are not fearful of the gestation period of trying a new territory. You're not fearful of that. It's you invest in that. It's part of the, I mean, if you go with an open mind and you say that, yeah, this is what I have to do. I mean, it's part of the game. And you know, there are no easy returns. You have to invest and you have to wait. And once you do it, then you get multifolds. I'm saying, I'm still looking at when we just opened a second clinic in Wembley after one in Harley Street in London. And I'm saying it should do so well today and started doing, you know, showing great signs of promise. I'm saying, I keep thinking that, you know, it is 100 rupees to a pound. So, I mean, I'll make more money then than what I make, uh, you know, through, through 10, uh, through 100 clinics in India. So 100 clinics in India, successful, is equal to one successful clinic in London. So all right, I have to wait for five years, and I have to wait for six years, and I have to experiment, and I have to try, but in the end, it's worth it. You have to find an answer. Like I said, people who lose are people who give up. Dr. Batra, this is a memento from Inspiring Conversations. I would like to request Dada Karasgi to please come up on stage.